karma points for you. Um, okay, and then I guess that we can start. We are 49, still are we one good? minute. Yeah, I guess, yeah, okay, I guess, I guess we are. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, so, still, congratulations for being here on Sunday morning. Still doing well. Perfect. Um, we're going to go for the fourth talk. So, we have here Andrew and Jay Lee. Um, and they're going to talk us about like, software engineering practices in Rust specifically. So, applause for them. And let's go. Hi, I'm Hoverbear or Anna, and this is my friend Jay or Busy Jay. As you can imagine, he's very busy. I'm going to talk the first half, he's going to talk the second half. We work at a company called PinCap, which makes distributed databases. We maintain TyKV, which is a CNCF project. It's a distributed transactional key value store. Those are some big words, doesn't matter. We operate at a really big scale. Uh, we were one of the first major Rust projects in production, and we've been in production for over three years. We're responsible for 15 petabytes of data at over 300 customers worldwide. As you can imagine, we do a lot of engineering. Some of our customers are the largest companies in China. We're used in commerce, where some of our customers have over 290 million users. In banks, where we offer really good SLAs with no data loss and on ride-sharing platforms that are consuming over 30 terabytes of data every day. This is a very high-performance, safety-critical system, and we really like Rust here. It's perfect. So, how do we go from beginning with Rust to actually doing some proper engineering? Now, you might have been at the point where you've read the Rust book, you've published your first crate, you're pretty happy, but now you get the big questions. How do I share my work? How do I migrate to Rust 2018? How do I do all of these other things I don't really want to do because I just want to hack? And you're probably going like this guy over here. So we're going to go on a bit of a whirlwind tour. I'm not going to deep dive on anything. If you want, we can talk about it after, outside. <laughs> so first, connecting and sharing your work. Uh, I've had the pleasure of helping organize quite a few of these conferences and, and events, uh, or being at them. The Rust community has over 90 meetups worldwide, and over six, well, six conferences. Uh, as you can see, there's some in Europe, Russia, and Asia. And a couple in the US, but they don't really matter. Uh, there's generally an event every few days, so most of them are really welcoming to newcomers, especially if you have a project or something interesting to talk about. So please do, we want more people in more speaker slots. Okay, next one. How do you get to Rust 2018 from Rust 2015? Because you probably didn't start your project in the last month. It's really easy, because it operates on the crate bound, not on some other bound like Python does. You can just use Cargo Fix, and it will do most of the work for you. The best part is, if you're on 2018, you don't really need to worry about people on 2015 because they can still use your stuff if they've used a recent compiler. It's a little bit different when we're talking about release level because we don't provide the same guarantees. As you may see, Travis lets you configure to test multiple versions. Please do so, and please test on nightly. It's very important. We want to know when things break. And tell people to actually look at your CI script to see which versions you support. OK. Designing your APIs. When you first make your API, you probably just go for the simplest possible, and that's good. Simple's best. But a lot of things when you're trying to move into real world use, Rust has a lot of trade-offs. Nothing's a silver bullet. You're going to fight from complexity versus convenience, readable errors versus flexibility, and speed versus costs. There's not always a right answer. So, for example, if you just want to accept references to strings, and I want to emphasize if you're actually cloning the string internally, take a string. Do not clone without the user knowing. It's really mean. They'll hate you. But if you're taking a string reference, you can go impla as ref str. And then in your code, you can just go as ref. This means you can pass a string, a string reference, or something else, anything that implements as ref str. 
Similar with collections. Your first attempt, you might accept an iterator. And then you're going to try and write and pass a vec. And you're going to realize that doesn't work. And you're going to look like this guy. The proper way to do it, you can try this using into iterator. And now you can pass a vector or an iterator. That's because iterators implement into, into iterator. What a surprise. Now, when you've been writing Rust, you've probably seen this error message when you call the function that returned a result. Now, you can actually make your own. If you've got something that needs to be used, you can put this must use attribute on your code. That's great, because now, when someone goes to use it incorrectly, they get the same error message and they go, damn it. So, if they consume it, it goes away. Great. Now, quite often you'll have functions that take optional arguments. Generally, it's best to use a builder, but that's not always a good solution for your problem. Remember, trade-offs. If you accept an into option u64 or into option t, you're going to find that when you call into in there that you can get your option out. And this means you can call with the value or an option or your, your happy little none. This means your user doesn't have to worry about writing sum. This is quite handy. You can do similar with the uh, variadic arguments, which we don't have. But if you're OK with having some really ugly shit in your code, you can, <laughs> you can simulate it with tuples. I'm going to show you a couple slides on how this works. First, you define some structure, because you can't implement things for things you don't define. And then you do some from implementations on what you want to support being passed in. Then you can accept an into whatever. Now, all of these things over here, they work just fine. It's really ugly. So don't use it all the time, please. It's not for abuse. Uh, one cool trick that we found in the last little while with Rust 2018 is you can now actually destructure and take from arrays. This was much harder in Rust 2015, and this is thanks to non-lexical lifetimes. This makes designing APIs that take fixed size arrays much easier, and you can do some really cool optimizations around that. So this seems really harmless, and if you're a beginner, you might be going, well, what the hell is special about this? But if you've been writing Rust for a while, this might surprise you. Uh, Wish will actually be talking about this later on in his metrics talk at, I believe, 1. Uh, a lot of people ask us about how we deal with errors. And we're doing some really nasty things with errors. And we're trying to move to using the failure library. Uh, because we found that the standard error trait's a little bit insufficient. And a lot of people agree. Uh, why? Because you can't downcast the cause of an error. You also can't get back traces. That sucks. The failure crate allows you to have both of these things, and it's really well documented. It goes out of its way to describe four different ways of dealing with errors in your code. Three of them, I think, are good ideas. Uh, <laughs> you've got the prototyping way, where you just pass around some strings. You've got the lazy way, where you just have a normal error type. And if you're writing some really high reliability software, it describes this other way called the error, error kind method. The first two, you can probably figure out how they work just from hearing about them. And this link will take you to the book, which will describe them all in excruciating detail for you. I'm going to give you a little bit of a demo of the error, error kind, just so you get an idea of what it is, and I don't have time for more. So first, we just define this error. And it contains this context thing, which comes from failure. Now, it's going to hold an enum, which we define down here. This doesn't hold, this is not a fat enum. It's just labels. And they have these attributes, which give some display message. And you can see we have to derive fail on it. OK, you've all looked at it long enough. I'm going to change the slide. Now we're going to implement fail for our error. And we have to define these two functions where we take a backtrace and a cause. 
Right now, we're just proxying to the inner, but you might do more in your implementation. You also have to implement display, but that's not a surprise to you. And then we implement some froms. As you can tell, from and into are just crazy useful. Um, it's important that you implement both for the enum and the context, because this is important on this side. Oh, the next slide, sorry. We also provide some way to get at that context. Now, we can call something that gives you an error, and you can actually add some context that's specific to your library. And the user will be able to downcast and get that original error and all of the context that comes along with it. This means if, you, <clears throat> if your user actually cares about their error, they can dig down really deep and figure out what's wrong. If they don't care, they can still just unwrap it and crash. That's fine. If they don't care, you don't have to care. You, also, you don't need context, though. You can just use the enum. That's where we have those two from implementations. OK. Now let's talk about fuzzing. And I know you all like fuzzy things. I did not bring any fuzzy crabs for you. I'm sorry. I'm actually talking about the programming technique. Now, fuzzing doesn't replace your unit tests, but it does complement them because it finds out if you've forgotten tests or you didn't know about them because you weren't that smart. Uh, but please note, when you're implementing fuzzing, it shouldn't be part of your normal CI test runs when a new contributor makes a PR. That's mean, because if you get a failure, which they don't always happen, that poor contributor is very confused. So Travis lets you define the, the determinant event type. If it's a cron job, which you can, you can make them, they're not hard, you can detect it. And that's when you should run your fuzzing. That way, every night or every morning when you wake up, you get a nice failure report saying how bad your code is. <laughs> so fuzzing is a way to randomly explore the, spa the state space of your code. This means that you're not always going to run over the entire space. And this is a good thing, because if you're running, say, over a U64 state space, this could take forever to find one edge case. Fuzzing is only going to run a few thousand every time you run it. So it's a great way to find bugs eventually. Um, and as you get more and more complex with your fuzzing, you're going to have a bigger and bigger state space. So you might think, ah, it's no problem to run through a U32. And I agree, but a U64 is a lot bigger than a U32. Uh, we recommend that you explore prop test, which is kind of the newest one out. We're actually not using it yet, but it's a really great crate. And we've been playing with it, and we'd like to adopt it. Um, it's from the quick check family of fuzzers. Uh, so essentially, the way you, you use them is you define some properties that get fuzzed over. It supports this idea of minimization. So when you're fuzzing over, say, a string, and it finds one that doesn't work, that's really long and crazy, it will go through a whole bunch more iterations to find the most minimal example it can, so that you're only testing very simple examples that break things. It also remembers regressions for you and keeps testing them to make sure you fixed it, so you can't be lazy, because we all like to be lazy, and tools that keep us honest are good. Um, the way you define how to fuzz over things is quite a bit different in prop test compared to the other quick check family Things. You actually define these strategies, which you can customize quite closely. Um, I think it's a really good alternative to libfuzzer or AFL or QuickCheck itself. Um, you might have different opinions. That's great. I support that. I like opinions. Uh, here's a little bit of a demo on how PropTest works. This is the most basic one I could think of. And it's actually part of their documentation because it's the most basic one you can think of. We define some ad trait or add function, and then we use this ma macro called prop test. And we define some ranges. You can see A in 0 to 1,000, B in 0 to 1,000. This means the fuzzer can pick any numbers between 0 and 1,000 for both A and B, try to add them together, and make some assertions. 
So when I run this, and I run cargo tests, it's going to run a whole bunch of them. And this state space is actually quite small. So it will probably only take me maybe five or 10 fuzz runs to get through the whole state space. As you can tell, though, this code has no problems. It's very simple. But if we were exploring all of the I32 state space, I might have some problems because there's such a thing as overflow. But you're probably like, yeah, I don't really care about testing over U32s. I use a whole bunch of complex types. So what about like a key value? So a non-simple type that holds two byte arrays. You can go and you can implement a function which returns this strategy thing. And here, or here on that tuple, you can see I have this, these regexes. And I can define these regexes to be whatever regex I want. And there's various other things, such as ranges, I can use for this. And then I call prop map, and I can use it to map to these, this new structure I defined. <coughs> so this function will actually return to me an arbitrary kv value with some vectors, two vectors, with random garbage in them. Now, when I write my prop test, I can say kv in this arbitrary function, and it will go and get out random ones a whole bunch. This is great. As you can guess, though, the state space on this is gigantic. So I could probably run this a million times and still have new outputs. So it doesn't explore the whole state space. It's not a silver bullet. OK, Jay. OK, thank you, Anna. Uh, and I just introduced some methods that help you to find bugs. And actually, it's quite easy to find out that an application doesn't work because it might panic or it will report errors. But uh, to reasoning the bug uh, usually can be hard because bugs can be unpredictable. Uh, it may be reproduced, it may not. And usually, you will need more information to reasoning a bug. Um, I have been into some situations that I, I add some print and rerun it again and, and run over this procedure over and over again. So it also needs lux. Um, so you might think that uh, I wish that time can just tip back so that I can, I can collect as, ma as much as information that I need. And fortunately, there's a tool that can do this for you. It's RR. And it's a tool produced by the Mozilla, um, just as the awesome Rust. And it can, rec it can record the failure once and debug the recording deterministically. And you can set breakpoints and watch points and execute it and reverse execute it. The command to, uh, the command to use this tool is quite simple. Just RR recall and once you find failure, then just replay. I will show you an example about how to use R to debug a Rust, pro uh, Rust, Rust program. Um, let me do. Okay. Um, I implement a simple program that um, just simulate uh, uh, a situation that has race condition. A fun fact is that uh, Rust, when you write code in safe Rust, it's guaranteed that there is no data race, but um, race condition is unavoidable. And so we have an account account has name and, and the data directory. When you initial, initialize an account, it will write data to the, uh, it will write its remaining money to the data directory. <laughs> so sensitive. <laughs> and you can query the remaining, and you can also set the remaining. And what we are going to do is the transfer. Transfer will first check if the source account have enough money 
If it, if it's not, it will return false. If it if it do if it does, it will um, set the remaining about um, to the source and the target. As you can see, this program is just written for the uh, just written as an example. So um, the logic is quite simple. And we can try to run this code. Well, surprise, it failed immediately. But as you can see, um, we are not, okay. <laughs> Usually we are not that so lucky. Um, <laughs> but but to show you, uh, it's a good day today. I thought it's Sunday, right? Yeah, okay. Sunday. Yeah, Sunday seems a good day. Um, <laughs> the point is, once we, we find out that it's hard to reproduce the bug, it always passed, then how, how can we do it? How can we solve the problem? Um, when using RR, um, due to the uncertainty of the network, I'm not going to run the RR in live, so I'll just show you some pictures to show how, how it works. Uh, the command you can see is, I use RR to record a program with a H flag. H flag means that uh, enable the chaos, chaos mode to the RR. It means that it, because RR actually will emulate a single core machine, so um, it will try to switch to other threads when there is some like six cores or some uh, some uh, instrument count is is rich. So the chaos mode is that just switch it, just switch it uh, whenever you can, so that we can reproduce the box very easily. As you can see that. There, there's uh, 78 in the end. That means I try 78 times to reproduce this bug. And finally, I reproduce, I reproduce the bug. Then I can replay it to see what's happening. And just type R replay, you can see it, it shows up a, a interface that is very similar to GDB. Actually, R use GDB in the, uh, in the hook. So, um, when you replay the, replay the failure, it will pause at the very beginning. So uh, when you type C, C means continue. It will just reproduce what we just recall. So it panic. It panic at line 73, which is, which is here. Anna has. Anna is expected to have no money, but it has 20. So let's check out the transfer function. It turns out that um, the value set here is 20. So we can add a breakpoint to the to that line. That is, um, I add a conditional breakpoint. If the remaining minus Amount is equal to 20, then break, then stop it. And I use a special command here, it's reverse continue. Because the, the program is panic, and we need to reverse it to the um, very point it just, um, at the very point error happens. So after reverse continue, we see that um, thread 2 hit the break point, and we just uh, enter an uh, empty command, which is repeat last command, just reverse continue. And it shows that there's two threads, different threads hit the same breakpoint. That means um, that's the very place um, race, race condition happening. Um, that's how we use RR. Uh, as we just said, that uh, it emulates a single core machine. So if you are debugging a multi, if, if you're debugging a thread application, it will have some decrease in performance. And the second limitation is it only works on Linux. Of course, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Okay. And so if you use RR to debug, a prop, debug app, an application and you find out bugs, so, um, and you believe that you fix it, but how to prove it? Uh, usually we should, we should uh, write a test case to, to, check, to check if you never fail again and to prevent 
is is bringing back externally, externally, in the future. But um, stable test case can be hard, of course. If you are lucky enough, it will be easy. Uh, Sunday. Yeah, Sunday. <laughs> and so to stabilize the bug we just said, we may need to we we need a special schedule proxy to the flex. But unfortunately, we can we can control this. It depends on the operating uh, oper operating system. So how can we do it? Um, we write a crate to do these things in name fail. Um, it's free implementy in Rust, and the and this thing is inspired by the FreeBSD's fail points. What's fail points? Fail points are code instrument code instrumentations that allow errors and other behavior to be injected dynamically at runtime. That means you can you can just use some like uh, you just use Use this uh, library to make some phrase like pause, or sleep, or yell, whenever you want to simulate some failures like um, I/O I/O failure, or syscall failure, or anything else. And this is the uh, GitHub URL. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to start. And so let's see how to define fail points. There are three way, there are three methods to define fail points. The first one is pretty simple. Just define a fail point using some unique name. And generally, when pro when application run into the fail point, it will just emit the fail points, just like as if it's never defined. And the second one, there is a closure here, and I will talk to I will talk about it later because it's used in a very unique case. And the third way is that we add a condition in the middle place. And the condition means that the fail point will only be triggered if the condition is true. So, um, like if you run some tests concurrently, you can just make the fail point um, taken in fact if the test is is the specific you want to run. So uh, you have defined a fail point. Then how can you configure the actions about the fail points? You can you can do it uh, either via the environment, environment variables. Or you can just use using the interface, API interface, inter, just using the API. And it's, it's quite simple. Just a pair of the name and their actions. Actions are defined in, in, the, in the format like this. There, are, there can be many actions. And only, only when the first action is not triggered, then the second action will be triggered. And, and every action um, is defined as P and count and task and arguments. P means that the probability that the action is triggered. And the count means that the mass, the mass times the, the task will be executed. And currently, the supported task include this many. And I think the task name is raised themselves well. Um, the only two needs to is right here is the delay and the sleep. Delay means that um, you can just pause the flap uh, for the given seconds. And delay will spin the flap. It's a busy waiting. So let's, let's take a look uh, to the example about a fair point configuration. This means that the fair point has 20% probability to print a light still alive, and have 80% probability to just panic. And if it prints still alive, it will print as many as three times. And let's see how to stable the um, race condition we just described here. And we can see that I define a fail point. Oh my god. Um, slow update here. Because we know that um, the race condition is that the line um, 49 uh, fetch uh, remaining can be, can be mutated 
um, before line 44. So um, actually, we should we should hold the lock the whole in the whole function, but it, it's not. So we put a fair point here, and we add a configuration to make it sleep uh, 100 milliseconds. So that, um, in general, if there's no bugs in the kernel, uh, oh my God. Um, flash will all block at this at this point. So that um, the stale read will will be always hold. So we can run the test to see how it happened. I think something turns out wrong. <laughs> are, are we in the same directory? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't have autos. So oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not my computer, so. But yeah, sure, blame the computer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, what a day. So it works. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and um, so no matter how many times I try, it always panic. And this, this is what, what we want. We use fail point to make a test stable. So um, when we fix the, fix the transfer, it should be not panic again. But how to fix it um, is beyond this talk. Um, so you, uh, how does fail point work under the hook? Actually, it will maintain a global registry that map the fail point to its configuration. So every time the fail point is executed, it will query if, if there is any configuration for the fail point. If it is, it will execute the configuration. If not, it will just ignore. So you may wonder that um, if I define so many fail points in my source code, it may affect the performance of the application. It's true. So um, we offer a feature gate uh, we offer a feature guard that can make you dis disable all the fail points at combined time. Um, so it's, it's also one of the Rust philosophy, just pay for what you use. Okay. Yeah, so it seems we both timed ourselves out to be about 20 minutes, and we were both about 12 minutes. So uh, thank you very much. We, we hope to see what you can build with uh, some of these tips and, and tools. Um, we're hiring distributed systems engineers. You can email me if you want a job. Um, we really like remote people. We really like open source. We like to read research papers. We write Rust, Go, and C++. Uh, we hire anyone. We don't really care what you look like or how you identify. We like creativity, passion, and teamwork. Um, but we have some time for questions. We have a whole 10 minutes. Uh, so if you have questions, please ask them. If you have comments, we can talk in the hall. Mm. So the question was, uh, there's some tools that exist that will actually mutate the code to see how robust your code is. Um, those are, that sounds really cool. I haven't actually encountered any for Rust. Have you? Uh, I'm quite new. Okay, okay. So I think, oh. I think that sounds really cool, and I really want to try that now, so thank you. <laughs> uh, more questions? So, uh, is it easy to somehow automate all the best practices you uh, mentioned, like using different parameters, like, I don't know, 
So the, so the question is, is it easy to automate some of these practices that we talked about uh, using tools? Um, Clippy will get you quite far. Um, as I kind of discussed at the beginning, a lot of these are trade-offs. Uh, for example, if you're using some of the into tricks, you should try and minimize their surface so that they're only existing in the public API because there is a compile time cost associated with them and some of them do have a small runtime cost. So you do need to be aware if you're just throwing these everywhere, you're gonna be paying for it. So a lot of these work best when you limit them only to public API. So I think a lot of tools might not do that. Definitely, I highly recommend you run Clippy on every build though. So uh, in TykeAV itself, we're currently using libfuzzer, which uh, does not provide the same level of abstractions and tooling. So we have to do a lot of implementation to get it work properly. Uh, it's very useful in tools like databases though, because when you're storing arbitrary strings and byte arrays, you need to be very careful you're not mutating them. Uh, certainly that you only get so much mileage out of fuzzers though. Um, there are other tools that you might want to explore when you're doing multi-threaded programming, such as Namazu, which will go and chaotically change how some of the threads are scheduled to help you find bugs in, in logic instead of just in properties. So, so the question is, are we aware of anything that reads contracts and helps us define properties automatically? Um, unfortunately, Rust does not have anything like whore notation, um, similar to what you might find in Ada. Um, so it's kind of hard to make assumptions about what the contracts is, are. Um, I have seen some libraries trying to add things like contracts to functions. Um, but most of them aren't really at the stage where I think they're kind of usable in production. Um, that's certainly something that would be very useful to a lot of people. Um, so if anyone's interested in implementing that, please do and tell me about it. So the question is, how do we choose the language we use on projects? Do you want to tackle this one? Um, because, uh, you know, we are writing TyKV. Um, actually, we are in a more big project, it's named TyDB. Um, for TyKV, is the underlying storage for the TyDB. Um, we want it to be, to be more deterministic. For example, if we, uh, actually, TyDB is written in Go. But if we use, in, use Go in TagV, it has the like, G-state problem. And its, it's compilation, its, its performance is not as good as Rust. And also, because the storage is the fundamental of the database, so we want it to be safe and fast. And, and that's why we choose Rust to build TagV. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think Rust, the way the drop semantics works uh, is extremely useful when you need predictable performance because you always kind of get really reliable function call runs. So the question is, what would make it so that we would choose Rust for writing TidyB, the, the thing on top of us, uh, instead of uh, Go? Um, 
I think we can both agree it would be it's easier to hire Go engineers than Rust engineers right now, um, particularly in the distributed systems space because a lot of Go engineers are out there slinging distributed systems code and not a lot of Rust people are writing distributed systems. And I would say that um, although I don't want to admit it, but Go is really flexible than Rust because you, you don't meet too much compilation errors in Go. So you can get things done very quickly. And in the circle layer, there is many functions and many other queries that you need to keep compatible with my circle. So use Go will be um, a more appropriate choice in, in this case. We got time for maybe two more questions. I, I would be very happy to chat with you and just give you a huge list because like we work on this stuff all day and it's our favorite thing in the world. Um, certainly there's lots of great blogs out there. Um, you can look at Nick Cameron's blog, um, Without Boats' blog, um, Aaron Turon's blog. They all talk about a lot of tools that are coming out and they try and highlight some really cool things. Um, but definitely, I think the Rust blogging ecosystem is really, really vibrant. Matthias actually runs a great blog he just presented. Um, and you can find out, I find out most of the cool tech we find from blogs. Um, and certainly, there's a lot of effort right now to make Rust things in research papers. As you may be aware, there's a, a Rust Belt project that's trying to formalize Rust and things like that. And they're discovering a lot of cool stuff you can do. Um, so certainly, I think one of the most beautiful things about Rust is the, the really heavy research bend on it. So the question is, does adding a lot of fail points make it hard to maintain your testing suite? Um. Yes, it does. <laughs> and so um, actually, we use we use fail points in production, and in Target, we they are, we we execute all the fail point fail point tests in sequence. So um, there's no races in in this situation. But we are planning a feature to fail point is that supports like uh, contest aware fail points. So that every fail point is bound to specific test cases, so they can run concurrently. So I think uh, in this case, there will be no more headache about too much fail points. And I think this feature will will come before the release of 1.0 of fail fails. Okay. So we're at we're at 43 minutes, so we should probably stop. It's been a real pleasure, and we can definitely continue the conversations outside if you want. Thank you.